after three days, raised again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to, began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are set in your mind, not on divine things, but on human things. He called a crowd of his disciples and said to them, If anyone, if anyone wants to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up the cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For that with for what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the Holy Angel. The Gospel of Christ. Praise the Christ, O Lord. In the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and redeemer. Of all the disciples, we sometimes are a lot like Peter. Peter always had good intention, but his mouth was always getting him into trouble with Jesus. Sometimes we speak before we think and end up sticking our foot in our mouth. Jesus warns us that what comes out of our mouth or what we speak can be very harmful and evil. Have you ever spoken badly of someone just because they spoke badly of you? Have you ever told a little white lie to make yourself look better? Have you ever said that you would do something knowing that you wouldn't? What we say will either uplift others or will tear them down. Have you ever repeated gossip or started a rumor? Careers have been destroyed and even churches fall because of unfounded rumor and gossip. All of this comes from Satan. We need to stop and tell Satan to get behind us. As Jesus taught his disciples, he was predicting his suffering, rejection, and death, and resurrection. It is obvious that the disciples understood that when Jesus spoke of the Son of Man, he was talking about himself. Peter didn't see the big picture. He only heard that his master will be killed. He didn't want his master, his best friend, to leave him. In, Ma in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew tells like this, that Peter rebuked Jesus saying, God forbid, Lord, this should never happen to you. Peter didn't realize that if Jesus didn't do this, then any of them or us would never could never enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus knew from where Peter received his thoughts and why Peter rebuked him. Satan has given Peter these thoughts because Satan knew that he was doomed if Jesus died on the cross. Today, Satan knows he is doomed, but he wants to take as many people with him as he can. So Satan is using every tactic that he can to mislead us. 
We need to learn to say, get behind me, Satan. Just earlier in the four verses, Peter proclaimed Jesus to the Christ. Now Peter challenges Jesus because Peter's idea of Messiahship was very different from the one Jesus revealed. But to call Peter Satan, that seems a little harsh. When we really think of it, Pete, about what Peter did, it is exactly what Satan did to Jesus in the desert. Peter's idea of discipleship ignored the suffering and the sacrifice that Jesus taught. We do the same thing in the modern church. We often try to live our faith without suffering and persecution. Satan offers Jesus the easy life in the desert promising the whole world if he would bow down you. And Peter is choosing easy discipleship here. Jesus rebukes Peter while facing the disciples and saying, you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Jesus goes on further to explain. In verse 34, he said, he called the disciples and he called the crowd around him. Holy Cross, we are the crop. He is talking to us now. And we should listen to what he says. He says, if anyone will come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Sometimes I take our practice of denying ourselves of things during Lent is counterproductive. What I mean is, if we don't fully understand the why. There can be a certain amount of pride involved when we successfully deny ourselves of coffee, of chocolate, of the ham and bacon. We often focus more on the accomplishment of denial instead of the reason for the denial. Scripture does not teach us to deny ourselves of things. It says, deny ourselves. There is only one reason why we should deny ourselves. That is to make more room for Christ. If you have given up something for Lent, and this is really a good reason why you should. Every time you think about that object, every time you feel the earthly desire for whatever it is that you should give up, replace that feeling with the thoughts of Christ. Remember that what he gave up for us, for our sake, was his very life in a very painful manner. He gave up his life on a cross. And now he tells us that we must take up our cross. Today, the cross is primarily an object of art or jewelry. But in Jesus' day, it was a hated instrument of cruelty, suffering, dehumanization, and shame. In Rome, a prisoner carried his own cross the place of execution, signifying submission to Rome's power. Jesus used the image of carrying our cross to in illustrate the ultimate submission required for us to follow him. Jesus isn't against us enjoying life, nor is he saying that we have to suffer pain to follow him. He is just asking for total submission. So we so misuse that word. I have often heard or read people refer to a heavy burden as a cross they must bear, or a sickness or tragedy as they cross. But bearing a cross 
is not related to our acceptance of unforeseen circumstances. Bearing a cross is not the result of a natural disaster or sudden illness. Bearing our cross means deliberately and voluntarily taking up something that could be avoided. It means that we choose to sacrifice ourselves for someone else. After all, that is exactly what Christ did. The cross for Jesus was his deliberate choice of giving his life a ransom for many. His deliberate choice of ministering to people's need for the truth about God and to the needs for love. And he did this knowing that the cross was ultimately the suffering and death on the cross. He then says, follow me. Just as he told his disciples, he just told his disciples where he was going. His walk will lead to suffering, rejection, and death. He is asking us to walk knowingly in his footsteps. To follow Christ means to love like Christ loved, and to live out the will of God as he did. We will have to deny ourselves, and we will have to take up our crosses. Following Jesus, we will face many difficult times in our lives. When we follow Christ and desire, and desire to live faithful to his will, we will surely encounter many forms in the world. We will have to make some very tough decisions to the cause of discipleship. We should be willing to lose our life for the sake of the gospel. Not because our lives are useless, but because nothing, not even life itself, can compare to what we gain with Christ. Jesus wants us to stop trying to control our own destiny and to let him direct us. Christ knows better than we do what we really need and how we should be living our lives. Christ asks us to lose our self-centered determination to be in charge. If you need a heart transplant, who would you want to do the operation? A plumber or a surgeon? That may sound like a dumb question. But we make that same choice every day. Who do you want to control your life? You or your creator? Who is better qualified? Of course, crisis. So why do we insist on controlling our own life? In our schools, we teach our children that they must be successful at any cost. As parents, we want our children to become doctors and lawyers so that they will make much money. What though is it if a man makes all the money in the world but never has time to accept Christ as his Savior? Because he is too busy making money. Aren't our souls worth more than all the money in the world? All the money in the world will not buy a single drop of water in heaven. Verse 38 of Mark's Gospel told us, If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes to his Father's glory with the holy angels. Many people never accept Christ as their Savior because they are too embarrassed and worried that their friends will make fun of them. Many people never set foot in the church because they feel the church member will make fun of them or may not talk to them, may not welcome them. Many Christians never witness to anyone because they are afraid that someone might make fun of them also. Don't be ashamed of Jesus. Be proud that you know him and tell everyone you meet about him. As Christians, you know that you have a 
home in heaven because Jesus suffered and died on that old cross. You know that one day Christ will come back for you. Are you so selfish that you don't want to share salvation with anyone else? Go home today and look around at all the people that don't want to share salvation. That all the people that call the same, if someone would just tell them how. Are you waiting for the preacher or someone else to do it? What if no one else does it? But you had a chance to do it, but didn't. If you accidentally kill someone with your car, could you live with that? Well, if you don't tell people about the saving grace of Christ, then you are sending them to hell for eternity. Can you live with that? Don't be ashamed of Jesus. He loves you and cares for you more than anyone in your life. There is no greater love than the love of Jesus Christ because he laid down his life so that you can have eternal life with him in heaven. And when all is said and done, we end up at the same destination at his side forever in the presence of our Lord. Matthew Henry wrote in his commentary of the scripture, and I quote, the happiness of heaven with Christ is enough to make up for the loss of life itself for him. Amen. Let the Lord